I'm not nervous. You're nervous. It's fine. <laughs> oh. um, so about six months ago, you guys might have seen this, Mario Batali sent out an apology letter for sexual harassment allegations. And at the end of it, he included a recipe for cinnamon rolls. <laughs> and I saw this and I thought, no one in their right mind is going to make these, so I made them. <laughs> and I wrote about it. Uh, the recipe, as it turned out, was actually terrible. So was his apology. And my post was pretty harsh. Thank you, I think so too. <laughs> um, Martha Stewart liked it as well. So the post went viral. Uh, Martha Stewart tweeted about it. The New York Times called it dark and hilarious. Um, but as with every post that does really, really well, some people have their criticisms. Um, I'm apparently a man-hating, vile drama queen. This guy said the rolls were obviously delicious because he was in my kitchen with me eating them, clearly. Some people had some dietary recommendations for me. <laughs> <laughs> and about 24 hours after all of this happened, my Twitter account was hacked with the promise that it would happen again. So, I had written a post about the Me Too movement, and then I got a ton of online backlash. And actually, that kind of made sense, because even though we tend to regard online harassment differently, well, it's not different than the harassment that a lot of us face on a daily basis. And Amanda Marcotte said this really well in an article she wrote for the Daily Beast, that online harassment needs to be seen for what it is, an extension of the constant drumbeat of harassment that women face and have always faced, simply because, well, we're women. So to give you a little bit of background on me, um, my name is Geraldine and I'm a writer. I'm primarily a travel writer. I have a moderately large online following. I have about 70,000 Twitter followers, and Twitter is actually my poison of choice, and so a lot of the examples that I'm going to be talking about today come from Twitter because that's where I get called the most names. <laughs> um, and as, as a result of this moderately large following, I get comments, lots, lots of comments. Okay, so you get, you get the idea. And I, I do get the occasional death threat as well. Um, and people are like, well, you know, it's because you write about feminism and politics, and I have recently started writing more about those topics because, hey, the world is burning. We should note it. But... Um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> But that's not when any of this started. Uh, I actually got rape and death threats when I was travel blogging uh, about my adventures with my rakishly handsome husband, pictured here and also in the back corner. What's up, hon? <laughs> um, and even when I was just talking about our adventures, I got comments like these. So no kids then? Great, because the world has enough Anyway, um, the thing that I noticed <laughs> was as my work got more attention, I got more abuse. And this was something that held true not just for me, but for a bunch of women who I knew and respected. Uh, this is a photo taken about a month and a half ago. I was in New York City and I had dinner with two women who I really respect and admire, uh, Lauren Duca and Jen Ashley Wright. And afterwards, um, I posted a photo of the three of us on Twitter and I wrote, tonight I plotted the demise of the patriarchy with these goddesses. And I don't consider this to be a controversial statement because anyone who knows the actual definition of patriarchy should know that it's not a great thing. But for the next 24 to 48 hours, my Twitter mentions turned into hot garbage. So I was told I was stupid, I was told I was ugly, I was told I was a moron, and for some reason a bunch of guys were telling me that they didn't want to have sex with me, and I was like, that's cool, that was never actually on the table. <laughs> so I decided to do something. <laughs> By 
the way, my apologies to the cameraman. He said I needed to walk with purpose, and I've never done that in my life. So I'm going to try and stay still. We'll see how it goes. I started to engage them. Brief warning, please do not try this at home. My husband, my therapist, my agent, and numerous strangers told me that this was a bad idea. But intellectual curiosity won out. So I started by simply saying, hey, I'm working on a project on online communication, which is technically accurate. And then we had a bit of a back and forth, usually during which they insulted me extensively. And my last two questions were always the same. Do they consider themselves to be abusers of women? And do they consider themselves to be misogynists? Now, for the most part, people didn't reply at all. This guy called me a Medusa, and believe me, if I could turn you to stone with just one look, <laughs> wow. A lot of people blocked me outright, which was weird because they were mean to me in the first place. And a lot of people just were vitriolic and abusive when they saw that someone was paying attention. So I couldn't really have a conversation with them. But a very small percentage did answer back. Oh, and, and, and some, when they did, had some criticisms about the project and the validity of it, like this young man who said that it was a waste of time and a fifth grader could have done it. And I will say, I've seen his Facebook page, and I also have comments on how he spends his free time. But I noticed that the arguments that they made and the ways that they justified their behavior and their abuse of women online, well, it's the same way that we justify abuse of women in general and abuse of, well, marginalized people as a whole. And for some reason, we're keeping these arguments and conversations separate. And I don't know if they should be. So, let me talk about some of the arguments that they made. The first, online abuse, it's not that big a deal. It's not that big a problem. Actually, almost everyone thinks that online abuse is a problem. Only 5% of people don't think it's a problem, and more than 60% of people think that it's a major issue. And an overwhelming number of women deal with online harassment. 41% of women deal with online harassment, and a third of all women polled who had dealt with it said that their last experience was extremely upsetting. And if you're a young woman, you're particularly vulnerable. One in five reports being sexually harassed online. And if you're a woman of color, you're getting the worst of it. A 2009 study found that non-white females are getting the worst online harassment more than any other group. This is another one that comes up a lot. Online harassment isn't the same as real harassment. It's virtual. It's on your phone or your computer. You can shut those things off. Well, one of the things I ask my abusers is, would they say these things to my face. And responses were mixed, but also really telling, like, <laughs> yeah, this guy was a piece of work. So he basically said, if the environment was favorable to me, and he says a lesbian bar, I don't know, uh, if the environment was favorable to me, he wouldn't say something. But if he felt that the envir environment was favorable to him, he would. So in other words, He'll attack you if he feels safe, but not if you do, <laughs> which is really predatory. And of course, do you consider yourself to be a verbal abuser of women? Well, the answers were resounding no's, even as some of them were being verbally abusive. Now, there were two underlying claims between all of their arguments, and both of these were problematic. And the first is that there's a universal separation between online and offline harassment, and that online harassment isn't inherently problematic. And I just don't think either of those are true. This is Anita Sarkeesian. You've probably heard of her. In 2012, she started a Kickstarter to explore sexist tropes in video games. I know, she's amazing, she's kind of my hero. Um, she was just gonna talk about sexism in video games and the amount of online abuse she has received is horrifying. She was doxxed, the threats were so bad that she had to leave her home. I just realized I'm not sure if this is how you spell doxxed, but that's not the point. 
Like, and if you look at her mentions to this day, they are terrifying. She's constantly insulted. She's constantly attacked. And people are telling her that she made it all up, that these threats weren't real, but she's just doing it to advance her career, which is a refrain we hear all the time when women talk about being abused. This is Leslie Jones. I'm sure you've all heard of her. She's brilliant. She's funny. She's talented. And when the Ghostbusters film came out, she was the target of a systemic, targeted attack that was horrific. Her website was hacked. Personal photos of her were leaked. Men were ejaculating onto her photo, filming it, and then sending it to her via Twitter. This piece of work was fabricating tweets that she had sent, and I don't know if you can tell, but he also decided to make them really racist and give them a homophobic, under, like, like portray homophobic messages and say that she had written them. And she was like, I, I didn't do any of that. These aren't my tweets. And this guy is still active on Twitter, and his profile picture is now a photo of Leslie Jones. She said she felt like she was in hell because the abuse that you experience online is real. Of women who had been polled, who had experienced online abuse across eight countries in a study by Amnesty International, more than half reported that they had trouble sleeping well, experienced panic attacks, anxiety, or stress, had trouble focusing on everyday tasks, and they suffered lowered self-esteem and lowered self-confidence. 41% said that they felt that their physical safety was at risk, and more than a quarter said that they felt that their family's safety was at risk. So when harassers say that their behavior has no consequence, they're simply saying that they don't want it to have consequence for them. Here's another one that comes up a lot. The First Amendment. You can't restrict my speech. That's censorship. Since this is something that's so important and comes up all the time, should we just recite the First Amendment together? Don't look at your phones. I don't want to cheat. Right? Are we ready? Congress shall make no law. Okay, this is actually going better than I thought it would. <laughs> Not going to lie. <laughs> I wrote this presentation, and I don't, there's like two constitutional scholars who seem to know. They're vaguely over here. <laughs> Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people to peaceably assemble. Congress. So Congress can't restrict your right to free speech. But these are companies. They can choose how they want to behave and, and how the people on their platforms behave. Like, <laughs> like if Twitter says you can't call someone the C word, that's not really an infringement of your rights. Like you can still shout it at your laptop. <laughs> And you have to remember that a lot of the speech that's happening on these platforms is not protected. Even under the First Amendment, you can't make hate speech. You can't do stuff that's libelous. And it's not legal to hack someone's account. And if you're truly concerned about free speech, then you should be concerned about the fact that more than three quarters of all women polled said that they made a change to the way they used social media in response to abuse. Women are censoring themselves because they're getting abused. And once again, if you're a marginalized person, you're the group most likely to self-censor because you're facing the most abuse. And when those platforms don't protect you, you're most likely to leave. Earlier this month, you may have seen this, Kelly Marie Tran, who was in the new Star Wars film, left Instagram because of systemic targeted harassment. This is a photo of her on the red carpet, and 
I love this picture. She broke down crying when she saw a fan cosplaying as her character from the movie. And this is one of the messages from her now deleted Instagram account. It said, let's tell more stories. Let's have more conversations. More love, less hate. This is one of the voices that's getting forced off of social media because of harassment. Now, don't believe it when companies, when social media companies say that they can't do anything about it because they're actually taking action in Europe where the laws against harassment and hate speech are more strict. They're just not doing anything here. Another argument I hear a lot, you're taking it too seriously. They're just kidding. Lighten up. Quit complaining. Get a sense of humor, you frigid. <laughs> there are kids in the audience, probably. If so, my apologies. <laughs> this person put this up in response after they called a trans woman not a woman. And I was like, that's, that's great. You've, you've attacked her in an incredibly personal way, and you're just kidding? I get this a lot. I want to be very clear. Abusers are not joking. They're not kidding. So a study by two psychologists found that trolls exhibit psychopathic and sadistic traits. Well, what does that mean exactly? So psychopathic traits means that you're lacking an empathy chip. And with trolls, they found that they had high cognitive empathy and low affective empathy. Now, cognitive empathy is something that probably most of us all have. It's the thing that enables us to say, this is going to hurt you. And probably we could all do that. We could all find a way to hurt one another. Trolls are really good at that. They're really good at identifying that. But most of us have high cognitive empathy, too. And that's the thing that stops us from hurting one another because we realize that that's painful and a sh thing to do. And trolls, trolls don't have that. So they enjoy hurting us, and they're going to do it. And that sadistic tendency means that they really, really, really like it. So they're going to keep doing it and try and get a reaction out of us. It's fun. And a lot of them literally told me that. And it's about power. They were constantly telling me how they wanted me to feel and what they wanted me to do. And when I started asking them questions, I found that that power started to shift. This guy, who said some horrific things and his account is now suspended, <laughs> accused me of harassing him because I was simply asking him questions. And they would do a lot of things to try and regain it. They would double down on the insults, and they would also try and make it seem like they were super excited about this project that I was working on. And when they found that they couldn't regain that power that had come from abusing me, they'd get really angry. And again, they'd double down on the insults. Here's another thing I hear a lot. Well, your online behavior isn't perfect. Oh, you're right. My online behavior is garbage. <laughs> I got into a fight with Lin-Manuel Miranda. <laughs> Please do not at reply him if you tweet about this. <laughs> a friend of mine asked me, what's it like to get into a fight with Lin-Manuel Miranda? I said, it's like being punched in the stomach by the nicest person I can think of. And the nicest person I can think of is Lin-Manuel Miranda. <laughs> And they said, that's not a very good analogy because I still don't know what that feels like. And I said, no, you really don't. But the point is, we all mess up online. That doesn't mean that we deserve 
to be attacked, and it doesn't mean we deserve death and rape threats. And one small mistake is not the same as a systemic harassment of someone, even if that small mistake is accidentally upsetting a two-time Grammy winner who brought the magic of history alive for a generation <laughs> of children. <laughs> I am never going to live this down, <laughs> but I'm really glad I got to use it in a presentation. I almost didn't include this because even though I hear this argument a lot, it creates a dichotomy that I don't like. It creates a dichotomy that somehow men and women are in opposition to one another. And as a feminist, I'm told that I hate men so much all the time that I almost didn't want to include it, but, but I felt like I had to address it. Here's the thing. If I say save the manatees, and you say save the whales, we don't disagree. We both think that aquatic life has value. <laughs> so yes, like men do face a lot of online abuse. They are slightly more likely to be called names than women are. But women are more likely to receive sexualized abuse, uh, sexualized threats. And that's significant if you think about the fact that one in six women will deal with either an attempted or completed rape in her lifetime. And if we try and separate those two things, we decontextualize the abuse that women deal with. We also need to think about how men are attacked online. They're attacked if they don't fit gender norms, and often with feminizing or misogynistic insults. And LGBTQ youth are much more likely to be harassed online. See, men are victims of misogyny just like women are. And that means that if we make the web safer for women, we make it safer for everyone. And I really wish this GIF had worked because it's Wonder Woman smashing the patriarchy. <laughs> it's cool. It's cool. It's just a reminder that we still have work to do. <laughs> well, so, how do we do it? How do we make the web safer? The first is that, yeah, I know, I had to include a Monty Python image. <laughs> the first is that we acknowledge that this is a big problem. Like, it's not just a flesh wound. It's, it's overwhelming. For those of us who work online, we're getting sexually harassed every single day. I had like a dozen new examples from just the last 24 hours that I could have included in this presentation, but I was like, I don't have time, and also I think they get the idea. <laughs> the other thing is, we need to call it what it is. It's not trolling, it's not kidding around, it's abuse, pure and simple. Online harassment is harassment. Online abuse is abuse. Thank you. If you have privilege, and trust me, if you are in this big, beautiful, safe auditorium, you all have some measure of it. Please use it well. And trust me, I am on this stage. I have a lot of privilege. <laughs> Mark Hamill he realized that a lot of his fans were the same ones who were abusing Kelly Marie Tran, and he was one of her most staunch defenders, and he was tweeting things like this. If you see people getting attacked, you need to check on them. You need to see how they're doing. You need to let them know that you care because they might not feel like anyone does. Amplify and support marginalized people because those are the people who are getting pushed off of these platforms. Thank you. 
protect yourself. If I pick up any single one of your phones, I should not be able to access it. I should not be able to get into it. There should be a passcode on your phone. Your passwords should be incredibly hard to guess. Um, what else? I don't know. Like, don't, don't make any password one, two, three, four, five. Um, make them all different. Two-factor authentication is great. I don't even know how that one works. All I know is when I forget my Google password and I don't have my phone, I am in trouble. You should feel that frustration all the time. <laughs> Let websites know that you are angry with them. Tell them. It took us years to get a block button on Twitter, but they realized that their audience wanted it, that their customers needed it, so they finally included one. If we tell them, hey, we're really tired of Nazis on your platform, maybe they'll do something about it. We just need to keep being vocal. One would hope. This one is tough because I don't want to tell you how to live and I don't want to tell you how to react. And if you are angry and you want to rage at these people and you want to let them know how you feel, you can. The thing is, a lot of them are looking for that reaction. Like I said, they have a lot of sadistic traits. They enjoy knowing that they've upset you. And one way that you can rob them of power is by not letting them know that they've done that. So, I don't know. That's kind of what I've chosen to do. If you want to do it, it is up to you. Trolls are, are kind of taking over everything. I mean, they're taking over the internet. They're taking over the language. Look, I just called them trolls after I specifically said we need to call them abusers. That's how entrenched it is. We need to reclaim the terminology around this. We need to start calling it abuse. We need to reclaim these spaces. And I know this is going to sound really, really strange, but today you guys are going to help me because I need to reclaim the narrative around cinnamon rolls. See? <laughs> All of this garbage for me started well, it started a long time ago, but it, it came to a head with cinnamon rolls, and I realized they were kind of ruined for me. And I know, they're a pastry! <laughs> <laughs> and about three months ago, Chris was like, what's the big crazy thing you want to do for WDS? And I'm like, well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these are these are not the Batali recipe, by the way. <laughs> Rest assured. <laughs> But Chris said, what, what do you want to do? And I said, it would be really, really cool if we could give everyone cinnamon rolls. And then I promptly forgot about it because the idea sounded way too lofty. And about a week and a half ago, Chris said, hey, we got your cinnamon rolls. And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> And he goes, the cinnamon rolls that you asked for, we got them. And I said, no, 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 because the entire idea was terrifying to me. Um, and he goes, no, we're, we're doing it. And, and then suddenly I was like, yeah, no, no, we are doing this. Um, so if you're not already holding a cinnamon roll and you can clap, can you guys please give the amazing team at WDS a hand? Like, And if you are vegan or gluten-free, I am really sorry. <laughs> Pretend that the year is 1910. 
you're a woman, and the cinnamon roll is the right to vote. <laughs> now, <laughs> as I have mentioned, I am coming from this with a lot of, like, a lot of privilege. And the way that I get harassed is still as a white, cisgendered woman. And I realized that there were a lot of women out there who were dealing with harassment in a lot of different ways. And after talking for a really long time, I wanted to give them a chance to speak. So I talked to some of those women and asked them to share their advice for other women who were getting harassed. And since there's nothing better than eating while watching TV, I wanted to play that for you now. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nagin Farsad, and I'm a comedian, and I'm also um, an Iranian-American muzz, uh, but who isn't? Uh, which also kind of lets me get a little bit more of the online harassment than the average person. Um, a lot of the, uh, the bigotry stuff, which can be fun. My basic tactic is to, like, disarm people by never getting as angry as they are. Um, and it turns, I mean, it turns them off pretty quickly. They, they move on to other targets. I think part of empowering other women is being a good ally to other women, which also means checking our own privilege and listening to other women, especially when it's uncomfortable. So there have been a couple of things that were really instrumental for me over the years uh, when dealing with online harassment. One of those things is humor, which I think is just a good rule of thumb when dealing with anything or anyone who's really challenging. Uh, and then the other one is chips. Surround yourself with people who are gonna energize you and remind you that this is not what you deserve to be around. You deserve to be around people who celebrate you and see you for who you are and all of the good that you bring to the world. People online are rude. They be saying some real rude shit. But I'm here to tell you that it's okay. When you stand for something that needs to be stood for. When you use your platform for good. And the YouTube comments just start being a mess. <laughs> People start being rude. Remember, can't nobody beat your ass. Won't nobody beat your ass. <laughs> Hang in there. Oh, and hang out with people in real life because it's, it's more fun and people, uh, your friends don't harass you to your face. I fangirled like four times when those people responded to me when I was like, will you help me with this project? Um, and I know, I know it can kind of feel silly and trivial to be sitting here eating cinnamon rolls after we had this huge discussion about online harassment. But here's the thing. You deserve to be happy. You deserve to be treated well. You deserve to have fun, and you deserve to enjoy cinnamon rolls. Like you do. Uh, thank you, I think so, and don't worry, I will get some. Uh, but so many of these people, so many of these haters online, so many of these abusers, well, the message that they're trying to spread is that you don't deserve any of that. And so the one thing I want to remind you to do, and I know I've told you to do a lot, <laughs> and I know I've given you a lot of homework, but I've also given you cinnamon rolls, so I feel like I can ask for one more thing, <laughs> is to be kind to yourselves and to be kind to one another. Thank you all so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.